I have a best friend from childhood. Her name is Jessica. We're inseparable and we always organize parties together. This particular night, we decided to throw a girls' night at her place, complete with pizza, games, and of course, gossip. Jessica has always been the life of the party, brimming with ideas. She suggested hosting the party while her parents were away for the weekend. Without hesitation, we dove into planning. We ordered a few large pizzas, curated a playlist of our favorite songs, and gathered all the games in the house. Lauren brought her favorite board games, Madison prepared various snacks, and I brought a cake to top off our festivities. The night was alive with the sound of laughter and chatter as we sat in Jessica's living room, surrounded by an assortment of board games scattered across the coffee table. The warm, cozy atmosphere of the room contrasted sharply with the chilly darkness outside. It was one of those rare weekends when we all managed to get together. Jessica, Lauren, Madison and me, Chloe. We had known each other since elementary school, and despite our different interests and paths, our friendship remained strong. This was our night, a sleepover free from the worries of school, parents, and the usual teenage drama. We had started the evening with a round of our favorite game, Monopoly. Jessica, as always, was ruthlessly buying up properties and charging us exorbitant rents. Lauren, the strategist of our group, was carefully calculating her moves, while Madison and I tried our best to keep up. Monopoly soon gave way to Twister, which had us all tangled and giggling on the floor. By the time we transitioned to a game of truth or dare, the room was filled with the sound of inside jokes and shared memories. As the clock inched past midnight, the games continued, but our attention began to wander. The conversation naturally shifted to boys, the usual topic at any sleepover. Jessica was talking about her latest crush, a boy in her math class who she swore had the bluest eyes she'd ever seen. Madison chimed in with tales of her on-again, off-again relationship with her boyfriend, Sam. Lauren, who was more reserved when it came to matters of the heart, listened with a bemused smile, occasionally throwing in a witty comment that had us all in stitches. I was lounging on the couch, half listening, half daydreaming about my crush, Jake. He was the star of the basketball team, and I had been smitten with him, ever since he lent me his hoodie at a game. The smell of his cologne still lingered on the fabric, and I caught myself absent-mindedly smiling at the thought. It was during one of these moments, as Jessica was recounting an embarrassing encounter with her crush, that my stomach let out a loud growl. The room fell silent for a split second before everyone burst into laughter. Guess someone's hungry, Madison teased, nudging me with her foot. I laughed along, feeling my cheeks flush. Yeah, I guess all this talk about boys works up an appetite. Just be quiet, okay? We don't want to wake my parents, she whispered, leading the way. We all tiptoed out of the living room, trying to stifle our giggles. The house was dark, the only light coming from the faint glow of the street lamp outside, casting long shadows across the floor. The old wooden floorboards creaked softly under our weight, and each sound seemed magnified in the stillness of the night. My heart pounded a little faster, a mix of excitement and the quiet thrill of sneaking around after midnight. Jessica led us through the dining room, which was filled with antique furniture and family heirlooms. The large oak table stood in the center, surrounded by high-backed chairs, their polished surfaces gleaming faintly in the dim light. A massive china cabinet loomed in the corner, its glass doors reflecting our ghostly images as we passed by. The room had an almost eerie quality at night, its familiar details rendered strange and mysterious by the darkness. Madison was right behind Jessica, her eyes darting around the room as if expecting something to jump out at any moment. Lauren followed closely, her usually calm demeanor slightly rattled by the late hour adventure. I brought up the rear, glancing over my shoulder every few steps, the shadows playing tricks on my mind. We reached the kitchen and Jessica carefully flicked on the light. The sudden brightness was almost blinding and we squinted as our eyes adjusted. The kitchen was a marvel to behold, a testament to Jessica's mum's eclectic taste. The walls were painted a soothing sage green and adorned with vintage signs and framed photographs that added a nostalgic charm. Above the island hung an array of mismatched pendant lights, casting a warm glow over the rustic wooden stools that lined its perimeter. The countertops made of gleaming black granite sparkled under the soft light, juxtaposed with the worn, hand-painted cabinets that hinted at years of loving use. 
a collection of ceramic mugs, each one unique, hung from hooks above the sink, while a quirky clock in the shape of a teapot ticked away on the wall. In one corner, a small bookshelf held a curated selection of cookbooks, their spines worn from frequent consultation. A chalkboard near the refrigerator displayed a whimsical menu of the week, adorned with doodles and encouraging notes from Jessica's younger siblings. The centerpiece of the kitchen, however, was the large farmhouse table surrounded by mismatched chairs, each one painted a different pastel hue. It was strewn with colorful cloth napkins and a bouquet of wildflowers plucked from the garden earlier that day. As we settled in, the ambience of the kitchen enveloped us like a warm embrace, its unique decor sparking conversations about its origins and the stories behind each cherished item. It was a place where every detail told a story, where the passage of time seemed suspended in the cozy haven of Jessica's family home. The countertops were laden with snacks, bags of chips, boxes of cookies, and a few leftover slices of pizza from dinner. There was also a bowl of fruit and a pitcher of lemonade. My stomach rumbled in anticipation, and I wasted no time grabbing a slice of pizza. The others followed suit, and soon we were all munching away, the tension of our stealthy journey melting away with each bite. We settled around the kitchen island, our conversation picking up where it had left off. Jessica was recounting another one of her crush's antics, and we all laughed at her exaggerated imitations. Madison chimed in with stories about Sam, and Lauren, ever the observer, made her usual sharp and funny comments. We settled around the kitchen island, our conversation picking up where it had left off. Jessica was recounting another one of her crush's antics, and we all laughed at her exaggerated imitations. Madison chimed in with stories about Sam, and Lauren, ever the observer, made her usual sharp and funny comments. The kitchen, with its warm lighting and familiar smells, felt like a sanctuary from the creeping darkness outside. As the laughter died down, Jessica got up to grab another slice of pizza. I can't believe he thought that was a good pickup line, she said, shaking her head with a smile. Boys are so clueless sometimes. Madison nodded in agreement. Totally. Like, Sam once tried to impress me by doing a handstand in the middle of the mall. He ended up knocking over a display of sunglasses. It was hilarious and embarrassing at the same time. Lauren rolled her eyes playfully. Boys, they just don't get it, do they? We all laughed again, the sound filling the kitchen and making it feel even cosier. For a moment, it was as if nothing could disturb our little bubble of warmth and friendship. But then, out of nowhere, a sharp, insistent tapping noise cut through our laughter. We all froze in place, our eyes wide with sudden fear. The tapping was coming from the living room window, just a few feet away from where we were sitting. It was so unexpected and out of place that it felt like a jolt of electricity had shot through the room. What was that? Madison whispered, her voice trembling. Jessica's face had gone pale. I don't know, she said quietly, but it's coming from the living room. For a moment, none of us moved. We just stared at each other, the fear and uncertainty reflected in our eyes. The tapping continued, steady and relentless, as if whoever was outside knew exactly how to unsettle us. We need to check it out, I said, trying to muster up some courage. We can't just sit here and do nothing. Jessica nodded, though she looked like she would rather do anything else. Okay, but we stick together, right? Right, we all agreed, our voices barely above whispers. We got up from the kitchen island, our movements slow and cautious. The journey back through the dark dining room felt longer and more ominous than before. Every creak of the floorboards sounded like a warning, and my heart pounded so hard I was sure the others could hear it. We reached the living room, and the tapping grew louder. Jessica took a deep breath and approached the window, her hands shaking as she reached for the curtain. The rest of us huddled close behind her, our eyes glued to the window. Jessica was the first to approach the window and pull back the curtain. There on the porch stood a dark figure holding a knife. My heart began to race. The figure was cloaked in shadows, the faint glow from the street lamp casting an eerie light on his silhouette. The knife in his hand caught the light, sending a cold shiver down my spine. Oh my God, Madison whispered, her voice trembling. We all stood frozen, our eyes locked on the figure. He didn't move, but the malevolence in his stance was palpable. The tapping had stopped, but the silence that followed was even more terrifying. It was as if the night itself was holding its breath, waiting for something to happen. It's probably Tom, 
Jessica's sister's boyfriend trying to prank us, Jessica said, trying to sound confident. We tried to ignore him, but the figure kept tapping on the window. My heart was still racing from the sight of the knife, but Jessica's words brought a small, shaky comfort. Tom was known for his elaborate pranks, always pushing the limits to see how far he could go. But as the tapping continued, a nagging doubt began to creep in. The tapping became more insistent, and fear appeared on the girls' faces. What if it's not Tom? Lauren whispered, looking at me with wide eyes. I could see the doubt spreading among us. Jessica's attempt at reassurance was starting to crumble under the relentless tapping. My heart raced and the uncertainty gnawed at my mind. I knew Tom was capable of some pretty crazy stunts, but this felt different. The knife, the way the figure moved, it all felt too sinister for a prank. We need to take this seriously, I said, my voice barely steady. We can't just assume it's Tom. Jessica's confidence wavered and she bit her lip. You're right, she admitted. But what if it is him? We could be overreacting. We're not overreacting, Madison said firmly. There's a man outside with a knife. That's not something to joke about. Lauren nodded in agreement. We need to call the police now. We decided to call Jessica's sister to confirm if it was Tom. Jessica dialed the number, but no one answered. Our fear intensified. The room was eerily quiet except for the faint sound of the tapping on the window. My heart pounded in my chest as Jessica tried her sister's number again, her hands shaking. The line rang and rang, but still no one picked up. What do we do now? Madison asked, her voice trembling. We need to know if it's Tom. Jessica hung up the phone, frustration and fear etched on her face. I don't know why she's not answering, she said, her voice cracking. Maybe she's asleep, but we can't just sit here and wait. Lauren glanced around the room, her eyes wide with worry. We need to come up with a plan, she said. We can't just hope the police will find him. What if they don't? We knew we had to do something. We should tell the adults, I suggested. But just as we were about to wake up Jessica's parents, the tapping stopped. The sudden silence was unnerving. We stood there, frozen, waiting for the next sound, the next clue about what was happening outside. My heart pounded so hard I was sure everyone could hear it. The fear was palpable, a living thing that wrapped itself around us. Maybe he's gone, Madison whispered, her voice trembling. I don't know, Jessica replied, her eyes fixed on the dark window. We can't just assume he left. Lauren nodded, her face pale. We need to tell your parents. They'll know what to do. Jessica took a deep breath and nodded. You're right, she said, her voice steadier now. Let's go. We moved as a group, staying close together as we made our way to Jessica's parents' room. The house was silent except for the creaks of the floorboards beneath our feet. Each step felt like a risk, each sound magnified in the quiet night. We cautiously peeked out the window once more, half expecting to see the dark figure with the knife. The street outside was quiet, bathed in the soft glow of the streetlights. Despite the silence, a lingering sense of unease kept us on edge. We huddled together in the living room, uncertain of our next move. We need to make sure he's gone. Lauren whispered, her voice barely audible. Jessica nodded, her eyes fixed on the window. Let's check again. Approaching the window with caution, we held our breath as Jessica pulled back the curtain once more. The street remained empty, the shadows playing tricks in the dim light. There was no sign of the figure. He's gone, Madison murmured, her voice filled with a mix of relief and lingering fear. But where did he go? I wondered aloud, scanning the surroundings for any hint of movement. The street outside lay quiet and empty under the soft glow of the streetlights, but our unease lingered. Huddled together in the living room, uncertain of our next move, we silently agreed that staying together until morning was the safest option. Despite our lingering fear, we found strength in each other's presence, knowing that together we could weather the uncertainty that gripped us. In the morning light, we gathered nervously around Jessica's parents in the kitchen, recounting the harrowing events of the previous night. Their faces turned serious as we described the dark figure and the chilling sight of the knife. It sounds like the same person that's been seen lurking around the neighborhood lately, Jessica's dad said gravely, exchanging a concerned glance with his wife. Jessica's mom sighed deeply, her expression troubled. We'll have to be extra cautious from now on. I'm glad you're all safe. The reality of the situation sank in 
as we realized the gravity of what had transpired. This incident became a stark lesson in vigilance and the importance of staying alert to our surroundings. As the morning unfolded, we followed Jessica's parents' advice, discussing safety measures and agreeing to always stay together when venturing out. The neighborhood had always felt safe and familiar, but now it carried a new sense of vulnerability. This changes things, Lauren murmured, her voice tinged with lingering fear. Jessica nodded in agreement, her usually confident demeanor shaken. We can't take anything for granted anymore. Throughout the day, news of the incident spread among our friends and neighbors, prompting conversations about community safety and vigilance. The police were alerted, and patrols in the area were increased to reassure everyone of their safety. As night fell once more, we gathered in Jessica's living room, the events of the previous night still fresh in our minds. The sense of unity and shared resolve strengthened our bond, reminding us that safety lay in looking out for one another. Though the shadow of the dark figure haunted our thoughts, we found solace in the support of Jessica's family and each other. Together, we faced the uncertain future with newfound caution and a determination to stay vigilant against any potential threat. As the days passed, the initial shock began to give way to a cautious adaptation. We learned to walk in pairs, to avoid secluded paths after dark, and to keep our phones charged and ready at all times. Jessica's mum insisted on installing additional security measures at home, transforming their welcoming abode into a fortress of sorts, a necessary barrier against the unknown threat. Yet, amidst the precautions and the shared vigilance, life carried on. School routines resumed, albeit with a heightened awareness. Our laughter in the hallways was tinged with an underlying tension, a reminder of the recent brush with danger. Teachers and counselors offered reassurances and guidance, urging us to speak out if anything seemed amiss, fostering a sense of communal responsibility. In the evenings, we gathered once more at Jessica's house, though the atmosphere had subtly shifted. Conversations veered from light-hearted banter to discussions about personal safety and community awareness. Lauren, always the pragmatist, researched self-defense techniques online, determined to equip herself against any potential threat. We can't afford to be naive, she declared one evening, demonstrating a basic maneuver on Madison's giggling insistence. Knowledge is our best defense. Jessica nodded thoughtfully, her gaze drifting to the window where the curtains swayed gently in the evening breeze. The neighborhood remained on edge, a collective held breath waiting for resolution or closure. Rumors circulated, speculating on the identity of the mysterious figure, fueling a sense of distrust and suspicion among residents. Despite the lingering tension, moments of normalcy began to weave themselves back into our lives. We resumed our weekend rituals of movie marathons and board game nights, albeit with an unspoken agreement to keep doors locked and curtains drawn. The kitchen once again became a sanctuary, albeit with a newfound awareness of the fragility of security. One crisp autumn afternoon, as we lounged in Jessica's backyard, the topic turned to resilience and the lessons learned from adversity. The sun cast long shadows across the grass, a reminder of the fleeting nature of innocence and the enduring strength of friendship. We've grown closer through this, Madison reflected, her gaze softening as she looked around at each of us. We've learned to rely on each other in ways we never imagined. Jessica smiled, a flicker of determination in her eyes. We won't let fear define us, she declared, her voice steady. We'll stay vigilant, but we won't stop living. Her words resonated with a quiet resolve, a testament to the resilience of youth and the unwavering bond forged through shared challenges. The neighborhood continued its cautious vigilance, but within the safety of Jessica's circle, hope bloomed anew, a beacon against the lingering shadows. As we gathered for one last evening in Jessica's kitchen before the semester's end, there was a palpable sense of closure mingled with anticipation. The air was thick with the aroma of freshly baked cookies, a comforting reminder of Jessica's mum's steadfast presence amid uncertainty. We made it through, Lauren remarked, a hint of pride in her voice as she surveyed our faces, each one marked with a quiet strength born of adversity. And we're stronger for it. Jessica's mum entered the kitchen, a tray of steaming mugs in hand. Her smile was gentle yet resolute, a reflection of the unwavering support that had anchored us through turbulent times. To resilience, she toasted, raising her mug. To resilience, 
we echoed, clinking our mugs together in a solemn pledge to face whatever challenges lay ahead, united in our determination to thrive despite adversity. As we settled into the familiar rhythms of laughter and shared stories, the darkness outside seemed a little less daunting, softened by the warmth of friendship and the enduring light of resilience. 